by Tony Gapperstone. Thanks for tuning in. It's showtime. Welcome. It's showtime, everybody. Episode 216. I have to like stop and think about that sometimes just to make sure I am on the right show. I am Tony Gapperstone. I am a writer. I'm a director. I'm an actor. I'm in Redwood City, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am a Caucasian man with brown hair wearing my knives out sweater, like my wife calls it. Uh, and we're in our Brave Maker studio with a lot of neon uh, pink and green faux, uh, fake green stuff behind me with the, the letters in all pink, Brave Maker. And I am pronouns he, him, his. And today I'm very excited to talk to somebody that is a screenwriter of one of my all time favorite shows. And, you know, you could say that and you could blow smoke up somebody's i don't usually like to blow smoke up people's behinds but when you're in you know the interview world sometimes you have to uh this time i don't really have to because it is true that episode 216 has a screenwriter of one of my favorite shows in the world called what we do in the shadows welcome lauren wells <laughs> hi the smoke has been blown yes <laughs> I feel it. It's received. Thank we're gonna you. get we're gonna get really kind of naughty and debaucherous today because yeah. of what we do in the shadows. And I'm gonna I want to learn more about that. Where does this come from from you? But you get to introduce yourself to our audience. <laughs> so those who are listening, go ahead. It's all you. Go ahead. My name is Lauren Wells. My pronouns are she, her. I am also wearing a very knives out adjacent yeah. sweater. Tis the season. Um, a, a turtleneck, if you will. Um, I am a Caucasian woman with a ton of freckles, brown hair, and I have a very artistic, eclectic gallery wall behind me of some of my favorite musicians and TV shows so and movies. It looks like something out of a TV show. like That would be like a creative's office. So you can check that box. Thank you. It took longer than I'd like to admit <laughs> to put this together. <laughs> Are you in LA, LA, by the way? Oh, yes. Um, I'm in Burbank. Yeah, nice. Where okay, dreams cool. come true. Yeah. Where dreams <laughs> and yeah. often go to die as well. So yes, you, yes. <laughs> so you are one of the few who have uh, found those dreams and are living them, which is really great. Yeah. And thank the WGA for the past month. Have or How long has it been now? Two months since the strike ended. Mm -hmm. Are back to work. We'll talk about that. But you are yeah, question the, mark. <laughs> yeah, question mark, right? You are the one of the screeners of what we do in the shadows, which we'll get there. And you have this new podcast uh, called Mina and Lucy. Was it the Guide to Slaying Dracula? I want to yeah, say Mina and Lucy's Guide to Slaying Dracula. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Twenty episodes. It's a <laughs> yeah, which is really cool. So before <laughs> we get into all these specifics, I'd love to kind of hear how, like, what's your origin story? How did you become a screenwriter? Well. Believe it or not, I'm like no one famous's kid. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's like one of the tried and true ways to break in me think i love it um, okay there's hope yeah. for me then <laughs> yeah there's hope for us all um i actually grew up on a horse farm in upstate new york up near syracuse and i had no clue tv writing was a thing like i it just was not on my radar until um I went to undergrad for English for creative writing and thought I was going to go be a poet and sell all my poems. And then I realized I, I really needed to make a living um, and actually be able to afford my, my groceries. So I put poetry on the side a little bit and uh, started PAing in, in New York in the city. And I was like on all those Oh my gosh, my Instagram. Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was on all those like Marvel Netflix shows, like Jessica Jones and Luke yeah, Cage in right, them, right. uh, as like a set PA for a bit and, uh, just was freezing out there exterior nights. It was a little cold and I got an interview to be an office PA at one point and they said, why do you want the job? And I said, well, I'm freezing out there. Let me inside. Mm -hmm. um, so then I started working my way up in the production office and then started assisting line producers and was telling everyone, like, I want to work with Tina Fey. I want to work for her. Like, she's my hero. And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, little PA, go get my coffee. Um, <laughs> dr keep dreaming. And anyone I met who I, I built a relationship with, I told them that I wanted to try to become a part of her team. And eventually I got my resume over to her company. And a year later they called and needed a writer's assistant, writer's PA um, so for fun. Kimmy Schmidt. So <laughs> that was my first writer's room. And then from there I was, I was able to get in more writer's rooms, but that, that was the way in. And it took, took a while, but that was, that's it. Perseverance, <laughs> perseverance, keep yeah. going. And I also hear you saying, declaring what you want. You're saying, you're yeah. telling anybody who will listen, look, this is what I want to do. This is what my destiny is. Yeah. And yeah, within reason, like there's obviously an etiquette to it. It's not that I was like wearing a t-shirt that had Tina's face on it by any means, yeah. but without trying to be too annoying, I tried to be very specific when asking for things because I found that when you said, well, if you hear of anything, let me know. That's so broad. And mm -hmm. if people, um, you know, learn of something at Tina's company, then they're immediately going to think of me because I planted that seed in their head. So I found that it helped to be really specific with what I was asking, um, even if it sounded crazy. <laughs> So I want to, well, first of all, if no, if you, if you're listening out there or watching and you know, Tina Fey, I'm sure you do 90% of anyone in this industry should know Tina Fey, comic genius, Saturday night live, mean girls, which iteration part two is coming out in theater. Like, wow. As a musical, uh, dirty rock also probably one of my top 10 favorite ever shows, mm -hmm. but unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was this little, um kind of under the radar show that was even like wackier than than 30 rock and i, I just think oh it's such a a laugh out loud like if you like 30 rock and you want it to be like even more insane then you need to find unbreakable kimmy schmidt truly so it's got bunkers it's got john ham it's <laughs> you know it's so titus so like crazy so you were on that show as a writer's assistant and we've had um yeah. you know screen writers in the past kind of talk about what those roles are like sort of the, and i hear you saying your journey seemed to be although long there was a little bit of like okay i have to do this pa job then i have to get this job then i have to get that job so writer's yeah. assistant is in you know the writer's room like the pa kind of ish right you're taking notes you're transcribing things like talk about that job a little bit yeah there's the writer's pa the writer's assistant and then sometimes a script coordinator is in the room too but not as often i found um but writer's pa is really feeding and watering everybody um which is so stressful lots of lunch orders and things like that but then and they're keeping you know the offices stocked with supplies and stuff but the writer's assistant um, they're mainly focused on transcribing the notes in real time that are happening in the writer's room as the writers are breaking story. And um, 
you have to be able to type real fast. Let's just say that that's, that's the number one job qualification. And I've been in rooms where you're typing down verbatim a transcript of every single thing they're saying. But then I've also been in rooms where we are just kind of taking down the general topics. Like if we're all kind of circling around Titus's story, we just are taking some notes about him. Um, so every showrunner has their own preference to how they like their notes done, but really you're just keeping them on track. You're keeping all the, all the writers on track and sometimes they get stuck or they're circling an idea and that's when you can jump in and say, you know, this is, this is what we were saying earlier. This is where we left off. So, yeah. So the, the starting at that writer's assistant comes with some patience, uh, some humility, being able, but also really being good at the craft too. Like you don't just get, you know, they're not just looking for warm bodies. They're looking for people who can write too, because there yeah. is some, some trajectory there potentially, right? Yeah, what's what's hard about it is it's often seen as an entry level job, and it really isn't. It, those jobs are really hard to get. It took mm -hmm. years of PAing to get in that writer's room, and um, there's only one spot, you know. Yeah. So it's it's very competitive. So there there's that element to it, but also you do need to understand how a writer's room functions, <laughs> um, because then hopefully you'll be considered for staffing purposes and you don't need a sample like a, a script by any means to get a writer's assistant job but um like no one's reading you before you get the job but i definitely find that it helps to have your own samples ready just in case someone asks you just never know when a showrunner is going to um ask you to ask to read you and you better be ready because <laughs> it's scary <laughs> but it's so, so when you were starting out there in new york did you have those samples ready did you kind of know what your voice was was it like hey i wanted to do kind of these out there kind of comedies did you already know you were in the monster world what was your voice at that point mm, i wish i could be like yes i've yeah. always known I've always known my brand. Um, no, I I knew that I wanted to do comedy of some kind. Um, I didn't. I was in grad school for writing and producing uh, for television at the time that I was PAing. So um, this grad school program, I was able to just go once a week, and then all the rest of the days I could couch it with PA gigs and and office PA gigs. Um, so that that really helped, but I didn't know, I didn't really have a solid idea of my voice and the things I wanted to do until I was in writer's rooms and actually seeing how the process worked and then developing my own stuff once I built the skill set up. Because I think now if I look back at everything I wrote, <laughs> you know, over 10 years ago or whatever, it, probably not something that would resonate with me now. So it just took me a little bit of being in rooms, seeing how it really works, seeing the process and then breaking my own stuff that way. Mm -hmm. I knew I always wanted to do funny things, um, but I didn't have it honed in the way I do now. And I think it just took experiencing what a real writer's room is like for me to figure that out. <laughs> that's that's cool. That's encouraging because it I know it can feel like when emerging artists writers are getting into the business almost like you do have to know your brand know your voice and to to hear you say it took some time and you were able to watch the process like i was going to ask you if you grew up in a horse farm in new york did you ever have any, any shows like that and did you have the sense of oh i'm going to bring in my real personal life into these stories and did those things go anywhere Mm, I think themes from my childhood and stuff are coming in now or relationship dynamics I noticed growing up bleed into the things I'm writing now, but I never really tried to write like, here's my horse girl journey, you know, um, I really thought I was going to go try to write the next mockumentary. I was like, I'm going to do Parks and Rec. Like that was the number one show yeah. that inspired. It's so good. That's the number one show that inspired me to um, start writing and just even realizing that 
TV writing was a thing. So yeah. I really thought I was going to go out and do these hard comedies. And now that I've kind of grown into my voice and figured out my the sorts of things I want to do, I realized I'm actually more of a dark comedy person and that I really like structuring things where all the plot is dramatic, but the characters are saying wacky stuff and they're mm. the ones providing the comedy, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so I just thought I was going to go do these, you know, half hour sitcoms and just go be a joke machine. But now I'm actually realizing I want the humor to be a little more subtle and I want to make it harder for myself mm -hmm. <laughs> by doing drama and comedy at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, that's my, that feels like that's what I would really enjoy too. So mm -hmm. lo I love that Parks and Rec is one of your faves. That is one show too that I, I mean, I liked The Office. I liked it. Yeah. But I, but I really loved Parks and Rec and I mm -hmm. felt like the characters, and maybe it's because of Amy Poehler. Oh, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler. There's some synergy there. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, the, the, for sure. the, those, those women and, um, so, okay, we have to jump into what we do in the shadows, but before we do, I definitely need to hear about relationships that have developed because I know we're connected because of Shelly Dennis and Shelly Dennis yeah. is a screenwriter I met on the picket line and she came on our show. She's on the Connors back to work now, which is so cool. She connected us, which I say, thank you, Shelly, for doing that. But She's before we talk about <laughs> what we do in the shadows, I'd love you to just kind of riff a little bit about yes you have to be talented and you have to persevere and it's also about mm -hmm. really building these connections so what was that like for you you didn't have any famous parents to no. give you a trust fund you made your way in it how'd that work out in that way with connections yeah i appreciate you asking that because i feel like when people take the plunge and move to la before i moved here and everyone in new york that i was working with said like oh la they're so fake you know I haven't actually found that to be the case. Maybe I'm being taken for a ride, but I've actually really found a lot of genuine people out here. And I think that, um, I think you get more bees with honey. So when you're networking or when you're on set or just assisting or even fetching coffees, like I just found having a really good attitude went a long way and treating everyone like a human, um, regardless of their status. and. Obviously, it's okay to be in awe of the showrunner or the director or the star of the show, but I'm not going to treat them any differently than how I treat the person who's fetching their coffee or their lunch, like, or the drivers who drive them or, you know, the PAs in the office. Like, I, I found that the projects that I've been on where I've built the best relationships have been because everybody treats everybody with the same amount of respect and they don't have bloated egos from the hierarchy of it all. I mean, not every show is perfect and it, it can be tough, but I found that when I was networking, just being genuine, being myself, having a personal relationship with them, wanting to know how their kids are, wanting to know how their weekend was, that went really far. You know, just b being decent to people went yep. a long way. Um, and I think I get a lot of random messages sometimes where people are like, hey, um, is Shadows hiring? Here's my resume. Thanks so much. And I'm like, you didn't lay any of the groundwork. Like, court me a little. Woo me a little. Like, tell me about yourself and, and ask, about, ask about me too. Like, make it a genuine conversation. Don't just, you know, go in for the ask so, so brutally. I think there's um, something to just treating everyone the way you'd want to be treated and also yeah. just being being genuine in in your interactions um because you, you don't want to get known as a phony joni oh a phony joni haven't heard that one before Fo like phony joni phony joni i like that that sounds like a <laughs> um a tv show or a short film i like that Maybe. i like that I know I should do something. I say it do a lot. Do something with that. That's yours. <laughs> you heard it here, branded Lauren Wells, episode two sixteen. Freaking story. <laughs> uh, so yeah, th I think that's really important. And you know, Brave Maker listeners, if you're like me, you know, you're always thinking about um, how I can move my goals forward, how I can get my things made, and those are important things to consider. And mm -hmm. we talk about like. How you know you do need to get 
those connections and you, you do need reps and or sometimes you don't but the idea of like there's always somebody out in front you're trying to connect but then we forget about the people who are here to my left and to our right and the people that we're moving you know with together if we were to link hands a little bit more and see oh i can maybe help that person to my left and to yeah. my right we could do things together and we can move together because five or ten years from now we'll all be in those places you know the people who are ahead of us sometimes like you're saying they're getting those dms the cold the cold queries and they just get so many of that but if we step back and go who are the friends that i could be building yeah. into right now you know that's that's honestly been the greatest thing for me like coming up as an assistant you know assisting showrunners having good relationships with them was great but the other assistants that i bonded with instead of it being a weird competitive vibe it always tended to be we're in this thing together and we're going to help each other get through it and if you drop the ball on something i'm going to have your back and now those assistants are development execs at production mm -hmm. companies they are writers too like they've um they've moved up as much as i have so those are the relationships just be kind to the people who are at the same level as you or below you, you know, on in the hierarchy, because you never know if they're going to be your boss someday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small it, it, Hollywood, quote unquote, seems so big. The entertainment industry seems so big, but the <laughs> circles that people run in become super small. It's like everybody knows if somebody or there's a the, Kevin oh, Bacon, yeah. six degrees of separation thing really is real. And that stuff can spread, you know, the toxic stuff can spread, but also the kindness stuff can spread like, yeah, and I'm so yeah. grateful for Shelly. Like we, we I met know. just by talking on, on the picket line twice. I think I met her once and then I was down there again, like a month later and I'm like, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm down. Da, da. And then she's on the show and then she's like, Hey, you like, I told her I liked this, sh your show <laughs> I as know. one of my favorite things. And then she said, she <laughs> told you, I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, just I listened know. to her episode, and, and when you got to your faves at the end, I was like, I know that show. <laughs> I know it. That's me. <laughs> that is so fun. That's so fun. Okay, cool. So be a good person. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean you need to be walked over, right? Um, I, I guess Yeah. One, one more thing I'd like to ask before we talk specifics about shadows is, what are some of those, you know, challenges and or red flags that you should be aware of? Because I think there's there's something we're not saying here. We're not saying that when someone mistreats you or even like worse than that crosses or trespasses against your personal safety or boundaries that you have to take it. Uh, yeah. I'd love you to just riff on that for a second. Cause I know this industry definitely has its challenges and it's dark side, yes. especially yeah. self care and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I don't want to make it seem like it's been all rainbows and butterflies and sunshine. There have been, you know, I've cried in the bathroom at work. Who hasn't? Oh. Like it happens. Um, I think, I think when I am in a sticky situation, what I try to evaluate is what will, what will the outcome be of speaking up? And if it's something that is just upsetting me in the moment, um, I really try to get quiet and think, what about this is upsetting me? And if I address it, will anything change will it get better can i um can i fix this problem is it impacting my ability to do my job and if it really if it isn't i will kind of just drop it but if it's something that i feel strongly about and it's impacting my ability to get my work done then i think you owe it to not only yourself but to the people who are going to be in this role after you or whatever yeah. that you need to address it in the most professional way possible. Our business can be so ugh, like you don't you never really see HR, you know, when you're working on these shows. You do like a little Is there an HR? I mean, there are them. Are they Technically, yes, like they yeah. are, but you you do like maybe one sort of workshop at the beginning of a season where they walk you through, you know, harassment policies and things like that, but our business overall is super informal and and especially if you're on the comedy side of things <laughs> making jokes um it can get it can get tough so 
I would just say if there's something that that crops up, really try to just sit with it and determine that if addressing it will get you the results you're looking for and just really think through who to go to before. Like, just don't be too reactive, I think, because you don't want it to cost you a job, potentially, um, because this business is all reputation based and word of mouth. Like I've gotten gigs where they didn't even look at my resume or, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, I've worked with Lauren. She's great. Go, you know, you need somebody great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very informal and that's good and bad. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, <laughs> that, yeah. That is really good. So uh, one thing I just will take away is kind of first stepping back, evaluating how is this impacting my ability to do my job and then yeah. assess how do I respond from there? And you know, I'm sure you're again, you have those moments where you're crying in the bathroom, but then acknowledging are, is there, do I have some trusted safe people that I could talk to and or process yeah. this with or get some help? So let's yeah. talk about the writer's room of what we do in the shadows and how you got that amazing gig and get to create amazing lines for some of my favorite characters on TV. Um, Naja, 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 come on, yeah, come on, my fave. Laszlo, Nando. I mean, is she your favorite? I mean, she must be. You kind of have, you yeah. kind of have like a non-vampiric vibe of Naja in some way. Yeah, she's probably my fave, or the guide, or the doll. The guy. Oh my gosh! Sometimes my wife and I are watching that show, and I just like this is so like ridiculously good. Like I just, like I unhinged. get mad. I get mad in such a good way. Like I'm so proud of like that this came out of someone's brain. Like <laughs> so. So tell me, what are some of your favorite parts, and how did you find your way into the the room, and what was the connect? All that stuff. It's really creepy how I went about it. Um, <laughs> Good. You know what? I'll, t I'll tell you. I um, I had been, you know, like a writer's assistant, showrunner's assistant, line producer's assistant, doing all this like above the line assisting, even working with some actors and stuff. And so I felt um, well connected at this point. And I was hitting up my whole network and going, I just watched the first season of this show and it's crazy and I need to be a part of it. Um, do you know where they write? Do you know, like my whole network basically was getting bombarded by me going, what we do in the shadows, what we do in the shadows. It used to be Tina Fey. And now I'm, I'm, I was blasting everybody about, um, about this show. And the week that I reached out to a friend of mine, um, she was a UPM on a show I worked on called happy for sci-fi and um, I was the line producer's assistant on that and I got to know her as the UPM and I just texted her and I said, Megan, do you know, do you know um, William Many over on What We Do in the Shadows? I, on IMDb, I see he's the script coordinator. And I knew to kind of, like, I'm not gonna go get a message to Taika Waititi or Jermaine Clement. Like, I'm not a crazy person, but- But have you, but have you met them is the question. Jermaine, yes. Taika is this elusive being. Okay. I, I have never met him. So <laughs> but Jermaine cool. was in the room with us season two. Ah. Um, and and he's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're doing your um, little stalking and IMDb connecting. I was, I was stalking. I was being a creep um, in the most professional way possible, of course. And, quote that. Um, quote that. That's so good. Be a I professional a creep. creep. Yeah. So bad. That that's a that's a good uh that's a good quote. Um no, but basically it was such a weird thing. I knew by now that it was best to connect with other support staff. So I thought, well, I'm not going to reach out to their writers assistant because I'm asking basically for their job. That's mm -hmm. not cool. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to the script coordinator. Um but I, I didn't want to reach out to him cold. So I had my friend Megan put us in touch because I saw that they both worked on elementary together. So <laughs> Megan sent an email to William saying, you know, if you need any writer's assistance, Lauren's great. I just worked with her. And um, it happened to get to William the week he was staffed as a writer and being wow. promoted. So he was actually looking for someone to replace himself. And he called me and interviewed me and I had just moved to LA. And he's like, oh, well, we write in New York. And I was like, that's fine. I'll get there. 
<laughs> so I um, got myself back to New York and joined the room for season two. But it was such a weird wow. chain of events to like, after months of reaching out to people to be connected to him the week he was promoted was so bizarre. And to this day, I I owe him a lot and I never let him forget it. <laughs> You hypnotized it. You like use the vampiric powers. You will, you hire, will me. hire me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's so fun. That is so so you so you just moved to LA and then you're going back to New York for the writers. Right? Yeah. It had been like a month here. And I was like, really? They wrote in New York. So I, I didn't have my place there anymore. So I, I hadn't moved back <laughs> for for the room. It, yeah. <laughs> It's these kind of like realities, like this business, you gotta sometimes yeah. be ready to do that kind of stuff. And obviously mm -hmm. it worked out. You've been with them since season two. They just, you finished mm -hmm. season five. So you've been with them two, three, four, five, four seasons. Right? Yeah. And six. Wait, is six already done? Cool your jets, Tony. This is an exclusive. Uh, is it? We wrote it. We wrote it, but we're about to start filming. So, yeah. Oh, we'll, oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Five and six, seasons three and four got picked up at the same time, and five and six did too. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, I was yeah. I, I was not clear when I I finished the, the season, which ends in a really unique way. I'm like, well, how, how, how is this going to, what's season six? What's going to happen? A lot of twists and turns, big, huge cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, so great. So because of the strike and obviously and everything, it was probably all delayed. But when is production going to start? I'm know? actually not. I know. I think it's at the top of the year or maybe they're starting to prep now. I'm really not sure um, the timing of it. But we wrote most of the sixth season up until the strike. So um, we were in New York for February, March and April working and on am it. I, am I, so I know it's, it takes place in Staten Island. Do they film in New York or is it Vancouver or is it in Canada? Toronto for That's Staten Island. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought. Okay, cool. All right. So give us some juice. Like, like this is such a fun, I mean, it is extreme. There are, you know, creatures, there, there's debauchery, there's lots of mythology. How did you find your way into these stories did you come with some of that like did you find yourself like i'm a creature fanatic are you still yeah. learning like what's talk about that kind of process what's so funny to me is vampires were the um were the monster i was the most scared of growing up okay. like i think i watched that bella lugosi dracula like way too young and I scarred. could not sleep at night. Oh, completely scarred. I couldn't sleep at night with my neck out. Like my neck had to be covered <laughs> by my cover. It's like my, up, you know, up to my face um, because I was just terrified of vampires. So it's really funny to me that I've now done a few projects that's all, you know, monster stuff because I'm such a wimpy shrimpy. Um, Another one, yeah. Boney, Joni, and Wimpy Shrimpy. Wimpy Shrimpy. We love a rhyme. We love a come rhyme on, over here. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, stay tuned for more. Um, yeah, well, so I didn't, I don't come into like each season necessarily with like, here are all the pitches I'm going to deliver, but we do a lot of homework um, where we research a lot of lore and stuff like that. So it'll be like, you know, your homework tonight is to think about um, fun monsters that could come into the, into the world. Um, or the homework will be think of grounded human situations we can put the vampires into. Um, so we go off and we do a lot of that work independently and bring bring in pitches into the room based off of the things we've researched and stuff like that. But I've gotten into all sorts of uh, lore rabbit holes where <laughs> I'm just <laughs> looking up ancient monster, you know, nonsense and it, it can get spooky <laughs> it, can, it, can, it can get scary but I will say like I was the writer's assistant for a few seasons before getting a freelance script and then getting staffed on the show and then getting promoted from there and what made me really um, feel like a part of the team was being able to keep track of everything we've established about the vampires mm -hmm. so I started a 
an unholy Bible, if you will, for oh. the show that kind of tracked, well, we say Nadja was born here. We make a reference to her in this year. We say Laszlo was born at this time. So this is how long he's lived, you know, just really fully understanding the things we've set in motion for these characters because they're hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to contradict ourselves when we're coming up with ideas for them. So I feel like helping keep track of the things we've established and making sure that anything new we come up with fits with what we've already said made me um, kind of a helpful member of the team, I guess. I found that to be a, a good way in. And then it helped me know the show really well. Yeah. So when I finally got a chance to co-write with, with some of the other writers on the season three finale, that didn't feel scary to me. I was like, oh, I know the show. I, I know everything about them. Like people will come to me and say, does Colin have a reflection? And I'm mm. like, no, he does not. Or yes, he does. Uh, so like uh, I, uh, I was uh. kind of tracking a lot of stuff that that made me useful, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, you're bringing value, which is such a great um, invitation for all of us as creatives when we join a team is if we recognize that we have skills and abilities and you know, my daughter's taught me the phrase pick me, you know, it's like, we, you don't have to be a pick me, like you don't have to be so insecure, like you're just hoping somebody, which often feels like the creative life, we're asking someone to give us a job, but you do bring yeah. something unique, right? And if you know it without being, you know, an, ego, an egomaniac, you go, this is what I can do. And then people recognize it. That's really, really cool. And then you're bumped up the ladder. Like, I love that. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. And I will say, I I'm glad you brought that up because again like i know i did some light stocking and probably came off you know it, it's a little creepy but there really is an etiquette to all of this and when i was even asking to be considered for staffing it's really important to know how you're gonna phrase that um mm -hmm. so it never was something that i just assumed would happen for me like oh they're gonna make me a vampire they're gonna make me a writer um mm -hmm. I, and I did feel like Guillermo, you know, for a while, all those assistant gigs <laughs> kind of uh, add, add up. Um, and yeah. I feel like it's really important to go about it in a respectful way. Um, so I had just, you know, reached out to the showrunner and and the, the number two on the show. And I had said um, something along the lines of, you know, would you please consider me for, you know, if there are any opportunities for a freelance script, would you please keep me in mind? I'm happy to, to share a sample. But at that point, you know, I had built the relationships, so I felt okay mm -hmm. asking. Um, but it never was kind of a demand like, <laughs> okay, well time to promote me now. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you definitely want to go about these things um, with respect to the people who mm -hmm. are, possibly giving you that opportunity mm -hmm. that's a good point yeah thanks for saying that uh, what i hear you saying it, it, there's an important part of sort of our due diligence i think in the yeah. industry we joke about stocking but really like we need to be utilizing our imdb mm -hmm. and we need to be researching and if you're going to be applying for a job well then you darn better have watched all those seasons before mm -hmm. and know who the showrunner is and know what some of the other shows that they have done I, you know, I'm on, on a very small scale with Brave Maker. There's a couple times where, you know, somebody will DM me like, hey, we or like some people think we give out money for free. We don't. <laughs> we help people raise money. Right. Uh, but they'll mm -hmm. DM like I'm looking for five hundred dollars for for this, you know, please give. I'm like, I don't know who this person is. And I'll click through. I'm like, oh, they're not even following us or me or like it doesn't make sense to me, you know, and it, it, there is yeah, like knowing what to ask for is huge because I'll sometimes get, I, I used to get emails where people were like, Oh, are you hiring a writer's assistant? And I'm like, you're literally asking me for my job. Like <laughs> yeah, that's my right. job. Right, <laughs> like, right. No. And I'm going to keep it. Or um, sometimes people would reach out like, Oh, I'm just graduating, you know, from this school. And are you hiring a script supervisor? I'm like, well, the fact that you're asking for a script supervisor job tells me that you don't know what yeah. that is because right. that's actually right. a set right. position and not in the writer's room at all. And um, no. <laughs> so I think it's really important to do your research, like you're saying. Yep. Do it. Gosh, okay. Know what you're asking for. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, okay, so I could talk so much more about what we do in the shadows. I'm asking maybe one or two more questions, and we'll talk about your podcast. Okay. So <laughs> you did. I, I rewatched uh, one of the most recent episodes from season five, the roast uh, of Laszlo. So many <laughs> clutch. I mean, there's so many just things that like how you know, like there was one line about uh, the Baron <laughs> who got uh, burnt. You know. Once at this point in season five, crispy. Done twice. got crispy. And I think uh, Nandor <laughs> makes a joke about he looked like George Hamilton had sex with pork rinds or something like or, I was like, yeah, where? I mean, you, are you just spitballing jokes and talk about <laughs> like that writer's room and you must have to, you know, oh, get a man. little raunchy wish... and crazy. Oh, we're disgusting. I wish uh, I wish that line was me. I'm pretty sure that was our showrunner. Paul Sims. He's that, I mean, it's so, so perfect. Um, and so specific, but I find that like the funniest things to us are just the silliest <laughs> and, and just the most specific. Um, I think at one point the Baron is hanging upside down in that episode and he's all crispy at that point and falls down and someone said, Oh, Colin says he looks like a shriveled up nut sack. Shriveled, yeah. Yeah. I was very proud of that. That was yours. <laughs> I remember that line. I remember that line. I was like, this is disgusting, but it's like something terrible oh, Colin funny. would say in, in that moment. But yeah, we um we do a lot of like uh stuff at the beginning of the season where we'll think about mm -hmm. what we call little sillies and it'll just be things that really tickle us, you know, that are just silly and a big example was nandor goes to space that was a card i think for like three or four seasons maybe that we just could never figure out what to do with until season five when we send him to space with a gopro and uh it's just something that like made us laugh for so long but we couldn't ever really figure out um so we do a lot of just what makes us laugh and then hopefully it makes the audience mm. laugh too <laughs> Gosh, but so yeah, lots, the one episode in season five where they go on to the news. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, yeah. Just, and the erasing, you know, the Italian neighbor's memories, uh, you know, Gizmo continually yeah. get, and then, and then um, Harvey, by the way, do you must have got to meet all of them in person. Actually, no. No, I huh? I have not. Mm -mm. Say more about that. Tell me more. I don't. I don't think I have. I've met Anthony Atamnik, who plays Sean the neighbor, because I cannot. I cannot escape him. We've been on four projects together now. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but um, COVID, you know, COVID set up a lot of protocols for us where we okay. couldn't go to set during that time. So okay. that was a big factor, and. Um, yeah, that, that just made it tough to, to get up to set. So I think that really threw a wrench in things because I'd love to I'd love to meet them all. <laughs> well, they owe, they owe you all of the things that you put into their mouths a great deal. Because <laughs> also what we do in the shadows has been like nominated, gotten so many uh, mm -hmm. uh, cool, att cool attention. And it's still like, you know, some people don't quite know about it. So get on it. It's on FX. Season six will go into production in 2024. You heard that here, everybody. Episode 216 of the Brainmaker Podcast with screenwriter Lauren Wells. It's so fun. You'll uh, you'll feel a little bit like a, a middle school kid uh, getting all of the, 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 the naughty jokes, you know, at school and then trying to come home and see if you can say them in front of your parents and being told you can, oh my gosh. So, don't, so. don't do that. We don't <laughs> recommend that. <laughs> no one said to do that. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, the whole Colin Robinson thing. I mean, I can't y'all, you all, please, please tell your whole team. I'm so, um, admire, I have so much admi uh, admiration. I have been so inspired. Hey. I told Lauren off, uh, the podcast that I did my own little mockumentary called creature comforter inspired fully by what we do in the shadows. And it was so fun. We had a group of special effects, makeup artists do like a, a werewolf and a vampire and the bride of Frankenstein, which I'm now doing a whole thing on with Brenda, the bride of Frank is that, and I just owe it to you all. So thank you so much for all the. I can't wait to see it. Heck yeah, I will. I will share with you. I'll share with yeah. you my script if you want a little peek into it. And you know, 
Um, I'm sure I can download what we do in the shadow scripts out in the world, but I, I need to, is that not, no? Okay. I think the only one out there is the pilot. Okay. I would love, I need to, I need to track it. We down are anyways. top secret. <laughs> We're oh, very top gosh. secret. So good. Well, um, congratulations on all that. So anything else you want to say that before we talk about your podcast? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> well, follow Lauren at the Lauren Wells so you can track all of her cool creativity. And I know I also saw you were teaching a comedy screenwriting class, mm -hmm. which uh, is super cool. So if you're doing that again, I would love to know. I am. You are. Uh, yeah, we're um, it's a five week class through writing pad and um, we're in the middle of one section of it right now, but there's a new section of it starting in the new cool. year. So, but this class, it's TV comedy one, and it's mostly focused on um, helping you break a, a new original pilot. And you'll leave with like a detailed beat sheet. So I walk you through just three act structure, tenets of comedy, just help workshop we have about nine students in this current class, so it's nice and small. So we do an online workshop where we get to really go through everyone's ideas. And Sweet. I'm so excited. All, all the ideas have been great in this class. So we're doing another section of it in the new year. Cool. Is it on a like weekend? What What are the normal rhythms? Oh, I've been doing it Sunday mornings. So okay. it's it's nice for people who are working and, and whatnot. So we've been doing it um, Sundays at 1030 pacific but um yeah we have people in new york and and all Sweet. over so it's fun all right check it out if you want to write your own pilot go to lauren's insta you'll find out more information and if you go there you will also see lauren has a podcast called minna and lucy's guide to slaying dracula so tell us about it i started listening i've been i'm two episodes in with my <laughs> 12 year old and it's monsters and it's lore and i'm like oh my god how cool like this stuff is continuing to ripple into your life and career so let's hear about it yeah i had a meeting with gen z media and they do all these really great family podcasts and they had a list of all these books, you know, just older books that they were thinking about adapting. And I saw Dracula on there and I was like, well, <laughs> I could do vampires in my sleep. No problem. So I reread Dracula. Um, I hadn't read it since college. And I was like, this is problematic. This is, <laughs> this is got You're like some problems. turtlenecks going up again. <laughs> yeah. But it was very like, um, not painting women in the best light mm. so i was like let's feminize this cool. put two um 13 year old goth girls at the forefront of the story mina and lucy who are character everyone is a character from the novel and a lot of the things that happen are inspired by the novel but i just took it and made it more modern and uh tried to add in some of the hip youth lingo i've never felt mm -hmm. older trying to write for middle schoolers i was like i'm not cool anymore uh -huh, <laughs> this so is funny. hard i don't know that i ever was cool to be fair but um it was really fun we wrote 20 episodes we i did i wrote 20 episodes of it yeah buddy and um we cast richie coster who you see there i worked with him on happy and he plays dracula and, and he's he was a really character, scary oh, ca character. Wow, <laughs> scary character on um, this show Happy that I worked on, and he agreed to be our Dracula. And he actually, that photo that you guys just saw, he um, was recording in my hometown, which is kind of crazy um, because I graduated with like eighty kids. Uh, it's a very small town. And um, he he went to my hometown because that was the nearest recording studio for him. So it was, it was just a great experience. And then uh, Bradley Whitford agreed to do yes. it. And he played, oh, oh, there he is. He plays Grandpa Van Helsing. He was so good. I was such a fan. Um, ugh, the best. And then we cast Sean and Charmaine from What We Do in the Shadows as well. Um, Anthony Atamnik and Marissa Jarrett Winokur. So good. That was so just really dreamy. fun to have them. I know. We got it. We had a really good cast. And um, the girls who play Mina and Lucy are, they just nailed it. They hit it out of the park. 
That's it so cool. Really cool. It's I'm very inspired and I was listening, thinking like it was fun to kind of hear the Easter eggs, like the lunch lady is Rensfield. And I just yeah. thought like, it's really fun. Like it just reminds you the creative possibilities that are out in the world. Like there's just no end to creativity. So keep going after iterations and changing things up and you know, you're feminizing it and you're making it applicable to teenage, you know, middle school girls. I'm like, it's just mm -hmm. cool. It's so, so brilliant and so fun. And we all know and we have been hearing about the expansion of storytelling through podcast, narrative podcasts. I'm like, it's, it's possible. And somebody yeah. can do this even on their own. It made me think with a project I'm working on, like this whole Brenda, Bride of Frankenstein. What if I started out with a podcast with my friend who's going to, oh, yeah. I, I could totally do that right now, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the sound design on, on these podcasts can be amazing so really like i don't know i think i think the possibilities are endless like it can be a book and a podcast and a movie and a show like it can it can do all these things it's wild um i had never written a podcast before so i was used to writing so visually for the screen so it was really interesting to write just what you're hearing and try to i was really struggling to not go hey, look at this thing I'm going to describe to you in detail now. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was tough. It really challenged me. And I'm really glad that that we did this project and made it happen. And I, I think you should think about it for your Frankenstein I, project. I am. I am grateful, again, for this connection, all the inspiration. You never know where it's going to lead. So <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, I hope many, many more cool projects like this and very uh, grateful to connect with you and hear all these things. And if you're out there listening, uh, this is just a reminder to you. We say this almost every week, but you got to keep going. Keep going after it. It might take time, mm -hmm. but just get to the writing. You never know where it's going to end up and where these ideas and your life's experiences are going to what like format they're gonna you know unravel in. it's really really cool um yeah anything else you want to say before we jump into our brave fave just about creativity screenwriting in general anything you want to say to the people out there who want to get to where you are oh so many things <laughs> i feel like we've covered a lot of it which i'm really i'm really glad about just you know treating each other with respect when you're out there hustling and not not getting so laser focused on yourself and your own career that you know you're not building genuine connections i think it's mm -hmm. so important to really authentically connect with people but this may sound cheesy or just kind of like yeah we know lauren but be writing all the time always mm -hmm. have always have something um to show because you just really never know when someone in a position of power or someone in a position to hire you will ask to read you. I remember the first time a showrunner out of the blue said to me like, you're funny. Do you write? Mm -hmm. And I just was like, yes, yes, sir. I do. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have anything finished wow. for him. So it really lit a fire under me to finish something and get it over to him. So I would just say to just, even if you don't feel super confident about it, just, try to finish that original pilot or that original feature, go make that short film, whatever it is you want to do, just to have something to show that that feels like you and feels like your voice, because you just never know when someone's going to give you a shot. It, I think I was called on a Saturday afternoon by our showrunner saying, we're going to staff you for a Monday start. Ooh. So I had to get to New York, you know, for Monday and your life can just change in a second. So be ready. Be ready. Lauren Wells. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm thank ready. You. She's ready. You all be ready as we hit the end of 2023. Let me encourage you to keep going after it. Keep, keep writing. Keep telling your stories. And uh, don't go away because we have uh, some suggestions of some things. We call them our Brave Faves. Brave Faves. TV shows, films, books, songs, technology, clothing, podcast, food, and more. These are a few of our favorite people, places, and things. Brave Faves. All right. So in this vein, this creature vein, I am going to share. I know you usually don't share like trailers, but 
It's a film coming out from an esteemed uh, screenwriter named Diablo Cody. It's called Lisa Frankenstein. It just looked so freaking fun. It just like it looked like a you know, like a John Hughes movie in a creature space. And I have been loving the Frankenstein creature vibe lately. It's um, a directed piece by the Williams and about a school girl who had a crush corpse, right? Why not? So check it out. I don't know. Uh, I think it's coming out February-ish maybe, but just the freaking trailer looked so fun. The music looked great, stylized. You know, and if you like what we do in the shadows, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to like um, Lisa Frankenstein. So check that out. Another feminized creature point of view which by the way we didn't even get a chance to talk about all the freaking metaphors in monsters and how beautiful that can be you know telling stories of outsiders and people who feel disconnected and misunderstood like that's definitely why i'm drawn to this kind of stuff mm-hmm. so the the trailer of lisa frankenstein that's my brave fave what you got i love all the colors i love it yes um well, I have kind of a two-parter. They're very different, but um, I'm doing a rewatch of The Righteous Gemstones on oh, Max. I love that show. Isn't it so good? It's so fun. I mean, Chef's Kiss, perfect. Oh. Um, I'm I'm just obsessed. That would be like dream show right there. You know, to be to be on as well to write on. To write on it, yeah, like what I just I love everything about it. Oh, so uh, Laura, we are watch. we are of the same. So I know we get, we'll we'll talk more, but that's m- some of my background. <laughs> I come from that world, and I love poking at it. I love to poke. We're at gonna it. talk. <laughs> We're gonna talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> oh, that's so um, and good. then this is a this is a little very different. Um, I've been reading a lot of memoirs this year. Like, obviously, read Britney's memoir. So amazing, but um, what she is, what she is, yeah. <laughs> I listened, I listened to the audio, but, but that part too. cracked me up. I did, well, too. obviously. I did too. Um, but actually, uh, I keep voting on Goodreads, uh, for Paris Hilton's memoir, it was right. so good. Um, I never, she never really was on my radar like a ton mm-hmm. by any means. Um, I just kind of was like, oh, the simple life. Yeah, I I know Paris Hilton, but getting to read her story was just heartbreaking, and the things she's been through, and um, the the troubled teen industry was not a thing I knew about, and she's really been such an advocate for kids that have been sent off to these really abusive schools, and and uh, you know without the parents knowing about it so i'm really uh i'm really rooting for her (laughs) not that she needs my help she'll she'll be doing just fine but her memoir was really well done right on i just saw she had her second baby she's got like two two babies 10 months apart i'm like wow yeah both through circuit i think yeah i think so yeah yeah that's cool. But yeah, I was I was surprised. I didn't know a whole lot about her, and then I read the memoir. And was I have a lot of respect for her as a businesswoman, and um, it talks a lot about her being at these really abusive schools and having to run away and then getting caught again, and just n- nobody believing her when she was telling them what was going on there. So it's it's a whole industry I knew nothing about, and she's now a huge advocate for it, and I'm I'm really impressed. In Paris, if you're listening, we have a screenwriter who could adapt your memoir for the future in podcast form. It's television. already being done. Is it? Someone's someone's adapting her memoir. Yeah, it was in the trades a few weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> Dang. And I was like, I was like, I want to be, I want to help. <laughs> it seems to have worked for you in the past, yeah. Lauren. So as you do I know. your your edit, your what do you what do you call it? your professionally, you know, um, stalking. Uh, yeah, probably professional stalking. Yeah, etiquette friendly stalking. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I'm like, maybe I should be a manager or an agent. Like I'm really good. I'm really good at hunting people down. I dig for, you. Awesome. <laughs> so good, Lauren Wells. Awesome. Episode two sixteen. Thank you so much for being on the show, Lauren. Do thank not you. go away. I need to say thank you to our our team, uh, Amy Cohen, who is producing this from Austin, Texas. Been live live quoting our awesome guest today. And then we have Jessica Cohen, who's our intern, who will then edit all these clips and put them on our social media. So if you're not following us on Brave Maker Org, 
please do so you can uh, get all these clips in your feed and reshare them because people need to know about Lauren and her podcast and her shows and you can hire her to adapt your next monster uh, series. Also want to let you know that uh, Burnell Amos edits our podcast and Carrie Alley does our social media promotion. So thank you to them. And finally, as you come to the end of the year, remember us, please, in your generous giving. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which depends on the generosity of people like you who believe in the arts. Justice, diversity, inclusion is our mission, education, entertainment, and community experiences. And you can donate uh, through text. Just use our name, Brave Maker, and text it to 44321. You'll get a link right on your your phone or go to bravemaker.com slash donate we're on all the places paypal zell all that kind of fun stuff and finally we are going to sundance we don't know if we have a film there yet we have four submitted but we're going regardless and we have two spots left in our condo right on main street if you want to just hang out with us walk to the egyptian walk to the library get on a shuttle talk about movies mix and mingle with all the creative people in the industry there's six of us going so far from the Bay Area to LA. We would love to have you just message me, find me. I'm easy to find and you can come join us. All right, Lauren Wells, last uh, time to promote your stuff. You want people to listen to your podcast, watch all your shows, follow you on Insta, Lauren, the Lauren, the Lauren N. Wells. The all right. No, the Lauren Wells. The Lauren Wells. The <laughs> Lauren Wells. But you have a website, Lauren L. Wells. That's right. Lauren L. I Wells. Do. Com. It's hard. There are a lot of Lauren Wells's out there. Some of them have gotten my tax returns. So, you know, oh, you, have to be, you have to be specific. <laughs> You're like, if you want to pay, if I owe, please pay. But if I'm getting something yes. back, you send it back to me. Oh, right <laughs> on. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely keep in touch. Um, if you have a few minutes and you want to stay right after, we can chat a little yeah. bit before I got to go and you probably got to go, but otherwise we will be in touch for the future. Everybody, Lauren, the Lauren Wells. This is so cool. Episode <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lauren, everybody else. Uh, have a great holiday season. We have, guess what? We have a show tomorrow. I am talking to an amazing short filmmaker who's got some buzz around the Oscars for her South our Sundance winning short film. So come check us out tomorrow. We'll be on all the places. Uh, Brave Stories Change the World. You are the story. Bye, everybody. <laughs>